So if I could invite the panelists for our next session on critical journalism in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which as we'll see is in critical condition. And to moderate this panel, I'd like to invite um, the chair of IPI's new Czech Republic National Committee, Michal Klima, uh, to the stage. He'll be moderating this discussion and I'll ask him to introduce our panelists as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will now speak about uh, what's happening in the Central and uh, Eastern Europe, but uh, I will briefly start what uh, happened 30 years ago because we have a, an anniversary. Just uh, yesterday, it was uh, 30 years uh, from the first uh, partly free election in the communist uh, bloc. It was uh, the Polish elections which uh, brought first time after uh, communists came to power uh, the non-communist uh, members of the parliament and it was the start of uh, end of communist regime and uh, Soviet occupation of this uh, area. Then it was followed by Hungary and uh, in the end of the year in Czechoslovakia there was such called uh, Velvet Revolution uh, in, uh, which started in November and uh, finished by election of uh, Václav Havel, uh, president of the, of the country, man who was just uh, the same year released from, from the communist prison. So uh, we, will, we will speak about how the media looks like after this uh, 30 years. And let me introduce uh, our colleagues uh, from, from these countries. So I will start uh, from, from my right. Uh, Kasia Kozlowska is uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Polish uh, uh, tabloid newspaper Fact, which is uh, published by, by Ringier Axel Springer. Uh, Kasia has uh, 15 years experience in uh, editing newspapers and books, and she started as an editor-in-chief just uh, this year in, uh, in January before she worked as a managing editor of the magazine uh, Dzienik Gazeta Pravna, and uh, before she was deputy editor of, of Weekly v Prost. She graduated uh, journalism at Warsaw University. Then uh, we have uh, Beata Balogová, who is uh, editor-in-chief of SME, daily newspaper in Slovakia. She graduated at the, at the, the, of the School of uh, Journalism of uh, Columbia University in New York, and she joined uh, the SME in December 2014. And she is also an executive board member of the International Press Institute. Uh, then we have uh, Martin Gerdieli, if I pronounce it correctly. Quite. Quite, okay. Please correct me later. Uh, he is a lead editor of uh, Hung Hungary's largest uh, uh, current affairs weekly, HVG. And uh, he reads historian journalism in Budapest and Hamburg. And uh, she wor uh, he worked before uh, uh, at uh, the Neb Sabacak, Neb Sabacak newspaper in uh, uh, 2003. Probably he will later explain what happened with Neb Sabacak. Uh, and uh, finally, my uh, colleague from the Czech Republic, Eva Hanáková. Uh, she is a, a journalist uh, who worked as a editor-in-chief of several uh, weekly magazines, uh, Business Weekly Econom, and Dotic News Weekly, which was the tablet uh, publication. And she started as a head of business desk of Hospodářské noviny, which is a lead, leading, and especially it was before, a leading uh, Czech economical newspaper. Nowadays, she works as a managing director of the Singularity University Czech Summit. And I hope she will explain why she is not uh, anymore in media. So I, I started with, uh, with the anniversary 
of the 30 years uh, of the of the free uh, politics political situation in 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 our region uh, and maybe just uh, to 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 connect it with media i have to say that independent press played a big role uh, in poland uh, as a as a result of uh, the talks at the uh, bet between the communist government and the opposition uh, the communists agreed uh, to uh, free publication gazeta wyborcza and uh, weekly solidarność so i will start uh, with kasia can you explain what was the role at the time uh, of the of the free free press how 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 it helped the fall of communism yes Uh, oh no, I don't need to put it on. Hello, thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity to be here and to meet uh, all of you. And uh, I really, uh, I was listening to a fantastic um, debate uh, just before and and uh, even um, yesterday. Uh, yes, answering the question, um, you mentioned Gazeta Wyborcza, which was a very important uh, title that got lots of public trust. Gazeta Wyborcza was uh, translating the situation into the audience at that, that time. That was a very, very modern uh, media project uh, then. And uh, lots of um, observers and people that were, uh, I mean, the, that was, the, uh, that was the, um, the people from the Solidarity who, uh, who established uh, Gazeta Wyborcza and who fueled it with the spirit of uh, Free Poland. So, so Gazeta Wyborcza is still a very, very important uh, project in Poland, but it is uh, for sure under pressure as the other media titles plus or especially media titles owned by owned by foreign capitals are are, are under okay pressure, so, so we you just uh, made the connection to the current situation so could you please explain how the current situation of media looks like in in poland maybe i will start with telling you something about the project that i run uh, this is a fact daily and this is a tabloid uh, it's kind of young, I would say, because it's it's only 16 years old. So this is the youngest, actually, tabloid in the region of the Central Eastern Europe. And um, uh, fact, uh, circulation is uh, 230,000 copies daily. And we have 6 million unique users, more than 6 million uh, on the Internet. This is fact 24PL. But, uh, and we are... I would say we, we, are, we are the leading project. I mean, this is the biggest newspaper in Poland, and this is the biggest media outlet online in Poland also. Uh, but uh, in description of our public broadcaster, we are not journalists. Uh, we are even not media workers. We are the workers of some kind of a public relation company that pursues... Uh, the interests of foreign capital in Poland and especially of German capital, right? I mean, we have this German label, uh, even despite we, we're, you know, uh, Swiss German owned, right? Because this is Rinier Axel Springer is a joint, joint venture. So, um, and so we are uh, pursuing our role as journalists, but at the same time, when you are uh, watching the public television, you are being told that we are uh, PR officers of German business in Poland. So this is this is about the fact and about uh, about our situation. And how is in it general, understood by readers? Do do they? Me? How is it understood by readers? Do they agree with this uh, with this governmental explanation? I would say that I, I would say say that this is quite complex. I mean, we, I know that we have trust of our readers. As I told you, we are two hundred thirty thousand copies, and it is a, quite a good result in Poland. I mean, this is the biggest one. Uh, but uh, at the same time, trust is a value that is not given uh, for good, right? I mean, you have to earn trust, especially when you live in Poland. Especially if you uh, communicate to Poles, you have to earn trust. It is not something that you can have for, for granted, right? So uh, I mean, this is challenging. I would describe it that way but still i have to tell you that before before i entered the scene i talked to my colleagues from poland because i have 
uh, my distinguished colleagues from Newsweek Poland, uh, from Forbes, and from Onet sitting there. And we were, uh, we were looking at our media landscape. We, had, uh, we found out that we have uh, at least 20 uh, media groups operating in Poland. And we uh, started talking to each other how many of those groups we assess as independent. And we uh, concluded that more than 13. So I would say that this is quite, uh, quite a good result. What does it mean for us independent? It means that they are not dependent on the government or, or ruling party in terms of their existence, right? That they, of course, we are all, all dependent because as you know, <laughs> the, uh, the government, the authority has the uh, has um, it, it can you know uh, introduce the new laws mm -hmm. and uh, and act uh, uh, as a regulator and uh, can decide whether we will exist or not. But I say about you know uh, we are referring to the to the current media, media landscape uh, and the possibility to survive without the cooperation with the uh, with the funds from uh, the government or the companies connected to, uh, owned by government, yeah. right? Okay, we will come later to the economic situation, but uh, Beata, could you please explain how the situation looks like in Slovakia? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. What I will describe is actually valid for the whole region, and 30 years after the fall of communism, we can see communist methods uh, forcing themselves back into the media landscape, which means that, that the, the ruling parties and the politicians with autocratic tendencies try to redefine journalism, and they try to deny the watchdog role of journalism. So they say that the main role of journalism is to inform. And, and they argue that, oh, we don't want you to do propaganda on our behalf. We just want you to inform, which, which means that they want us to pass on their messages. Also, other very typical communist type of act, the communist type of habit. And, and my colleague from Poland mentioned that already labeling critical media as enemies of the nation. It's no longer you know, agents of imperialist powers, but we are agents of uh, George Soros and agents of, of foreign powers. Also, as, as uh, happened in Slovakia after the murder of my colleague Jan Kuciak, turned out that there was a massive surveillance of journalists. There was an organized group which included uh, some people from the intelligence service. It, it included uh, even a social worker. It included uh, other corrupted journalists. And it was a systematic surveillance of critical journalists. It, ha it went on for one year, if the, even after the murder of, of our colleague. And they were recording traces, journalists moved, they were taking pictures of their families, children. They were looking into their tax issues, and even some members of the police were helpful. And uh, those of us who might remember some tales from communism, that's very similar. So I think that, that we are again facing the challenge of actually fighting for the definition of journalism. And we haven't even mentioned uh, the hybrid war and, and the influence of Russia on the region when, when uh, there are so many finances are going into troll armies and, and into social sites. So this is a, a quite uh, serious combination of factors which define partly the media scene. And, and of course, there is also a positive message behind it because also, as, as uh, my colleague mentioned, there are new projects emerging. And, and uh, we can see that, that again, it, it somehow uh, distills down to the essence of journalist, journal, journalism. And, and uh, in Slovakia, uh, journalists, even working under the financial group Penta, are trying somehow to, to keep their independence. This is possible under some publishing houses, 
where, for example, in my publishing houses, when this uh, toxic financial group has only a minority share, in others not. And probably we will return to that point later in the discussion. So I, I think that that's how I would sum up um, my part of the story. And I am sure that Martin will continue in a very similar tone. But what have to be added, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, uh, that you said that this is, uh, it, it, it reminds the tales of the communists, but we have to recognize that the, the tools, uh, the advanced tools of surveillance are now much more modern, much more advanced, and you know, this is not like in communists, this is much farther, right, I today? Agree with you with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, technology has changed, that's, yeah. that's for sure, but if someone would wake up out of a 30 years uh, coma in Hungary uh, and would look at the Hungarian media, uh, he would uh, recognize it as familiar. Um, 30 years ago, there was a press palace where a lot of uh, different media outlets uh, were residing, uh, that the censors had uh, easier access to all of them. Uh, so actually, in one house, you had uh, magazines for suing, crossword puzzle, the biggest daily, the sports daily, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, since and last and autumn... Did it belong to the Communist Party? Yeah, belonging to the Communist Party. And, and since uh, autumn uh, 2018, uh, there's a new uh, monster on the Hungarian market uh, called Keshma, um, which uh, unites 476 different titles. Uh, it has uh, crossword puzzles in sewing magazines and cooking magazines and political dailies and sports dailies and TV channels. Um, that this added to the to the Hungarian state TV, which is uh, not uh, uh, working for the public but working for the government. Uh, this uh, altogether gives a very similar picture as it has been uh, 30 years ago. And perhaps, uh, if I can mention, um, new data shows that 80% uh, uh, of all revenue uh, in the Hungarian media uh, landscape. Uh, on the private uh, side is uh, going to Kashma and uh, the government aligned uh, press. So it's 80% of all revenue. Um, and um, I would only tell one uh, single headline uh, of TV2, which is part of this uh, huge group. Uh, so how do they operate? Um, a year ago, they had a headline, George Soros wanted to kill his mother. Uh, Yes, uh, it turned out uh, that George Soros has written in 1980 um, a very pers personal piece about euthanasia and about the horrible thought that it might come down to his decision if his very sick mother would seek euthanasia, whether he, is grant whether he can grant him this wish or not. That was the article about. Uh, the mother died before, so there was, uh, George Soros didn't have to make that decision. This was a 30 year old piece, and TV2 has brought the headline George Soros wanted to kill his mother. This is the niveau the Hungarian uh, government propaganda is working. Okay, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the situation uh, which happened last year, but this was not the first change. Your own newspaper, Nepsabatshak, was closed some time ago. How was it? I, you know, uh, it happened 2016, but the, the but the, the the situation got so much worse that I'm but, but that, that that I really stopped uh, speaking about that. Yes, the, the, the number one uh, daily uh, political newspaper was taken from the market. It was by far the biggest. Uh, uh, it, was take, it was shut down with cynical lies. Uh, 90 uh, people were, uh, uh, have, have found themselves on the streets one, from one day on the, on the other. It was uh, orchestrated like an ambush, so um, they pretended that we are moving the, the office from one building to the other. We packed our own things. We've made the last issue at the old office. Uh, we were supposed to make the next issue from the next office, but the, the doors never opened again. Um, 
they didn't tell us, uh, they didn't look us in the eye, uh, what we've, uh, uh, how we, uh, we got news from it uh, was that, um, that suddenly we, we so it was, it was a normal Saturday, we were not working, we wanted to check our emails and it was, uh, you know, given, uh, giving us a, an automated uh, uh, answer that we are not authorized to access our mails. Um, and we didn't understand what's happening. We thought, yeah, the servers are being moved from one building to the other. And then uh, the company gave out a statement to other media outlets and we've read it in the news that we are shut down. Uh, we haven't been allowed to access our mails anymore, our contacts anymore, our investigative material anymore, our offices anymore, our uh, 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 computers anymore. So this is how they've done it. Um, they've got away with it. Uh, uh, now, uh, you know, uh, the European People, People's Party is discussing how uh, how long Orban has to make a sad face that he can rejoin the group. Um, and uh, meanwhile, there was uh, Magyar Nemzet uh, being shut down, another daily, Heti Valas, a weekly. Um, here, TV's all uh, staff was fired and then taken over. Uh, so uh, at least three other main uh, media outlets were shut down since. Can Thank I just you. add one comment that uh, Viktor Orbán is already inspiring uh, politicians with autocratic tendencies across the region. I know that Babish expressed admiration for the, the Czech Prime Minister for Viktor Orbán. And we can see that, that uh, in Austria, also Viktor Orbán's abilities to suffocate free media get uh, resonated quite strongly. And, and that's why maybe one comment that it is important uh, for European Union institutions, European Commission to understand that press freedom is not an internal issue of state member states. And that press freedom is actually targeted and, and it is to protect uh, democratic institutions and European institutions. And when they close eye over conduct of one member and, and deviation from, from democracy, basically uh, they, they close an eye over the spread of, of a very dangerous virus. Thank you. Okay, luckily, Czech uh, people are not inspired by Hungarian people and Czech support of Mr. Babish is much less than in Hungary support of Mr. Orban. Okay, Eva, uh, Czechs were in one uh, country with Slovaks 30 years ago, but uh, then uh, the country split it and now we have also the media are, are separate. What is the situation of media in the Czech Republic and how is it, if you can compare with Slovakia, how may I explain it? Well, I think that uh, just uh, after the fall of communism in 1988, uh, the situation as for uh, press freedom started to be very, very favorable, as, uh, I mean. Uh, there were so many, uh, mainly German publishers, entering the uh, the Czech market, and they were able actually to install the competent top management into different uh, publishing houses in the Czech Republic. Uh, me personally, I think that the situation started to change uh, in uh, 2013, actually. Uh, and I remember the one date, it was uh, uh, actually six years ago, uh, 26, June 26, when uh, Andrei Babish, our current prime minister, actually entered the media market and he bought um, uh, the publishing house called uh, Mafra. Uh, Mafra really, uh, in history, it was really like a huge publishing house with uh, two main uh, uh, liberal dailies. They were they were so many uh, investigative journalists working uh, for uh, both these uh, uh, dailies. And then uh, I think that uh, Robert is sitting here. Robert used to be uh, the editor in chief of, of uh, one of these dailies uh, in that times. And uh, what is necessary to say? So Andrei Babish uh, bought uh, Mafra, and then. Uh, 
a couple of months afterwards, we, he actually like uh, uh, actively entered the, the, the Czech politics and uh, he uh, was able to gain during the elections uh, more than 20% and he actually uh, got uh, uh, himself and, and other guys from, from his uh, party into, into the Czech parliament. And so the situation uh, started to be quite weird because many of good journalists actually left because they were not able to accept the situation uh, that uh, the, the, the member of, of, uh, of government is actually uh, the, the owner of uh, the main important dailies in the Czech Republic. And what is uh, necessary to say, uh, Andrei Babiš uh, is quite often compared to Berlusconi. So there are so many like titles uh, that uh, Andrei Babiš is Czech Berlusconi. Uh, I would like to say that uh, whereas uh, Berlusconi, uh, he entered the, the, the media business uh, to earn the money, uh, but Andrei Babiš, he actually entered the media business to spend money there and to get uh, into power, and he succeeded, actually. Uh, so uh, what, what, what happened afterwards? A uh, couple of journalists uh, decided to leave uh, uh, Mafra. Uh, many of them were fired, actually. A uh, couple of them just uh, accepted the situation until today they are willing to write uh, according to the guidelines of, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the big leader, Andrei Babish. And uh, one positive thing that I would love to, to, to mention now is that uh, uh, the, the journalists uh, that uh, left uh, Mafra Publishing House, uh, some of them we are able to... Uh, to start their own independent uh, small media projects that are actually viable till today, uh, and um, uh, I think that this is this is positive thing. Okay, uh, and one one more remark. So uh, when Andre Babish actually bought uh, the the Mafra Publishing House, he started a new wave of buyings. So if you, for instance, take uh, the, the the list of the most richest person in the Czech Republic nowadays, so uh, five out out of ten are actually the owners today. The main publishing houses uh, in the Czech Republic. So I think that this is the main difference uh, uh, because nowadays uh, we actually do not have the, the foreign traditional uh, publishers as the owner, but we, uh, the, the, the media ownership is actually uh, in, in hands of the local billionaires or oligarchs or however you want to call them. Perhaps about Hungary, I would add, because uh, last autumn, till last autumn, the richest in the country did own the media. But it was very telling how this new foundation has united those 476 uh, titles, because the richest people in Hungary gave, it, gave their companies as a gift to this foundation for free. Now, if you think about it, who gives away a company for free? It's surely one who thinks that, that that company wasn't his own before and that he wasn't building up with his own money because otherwise he would have asked money for it. So it means it, it's a very obvious sign that the Hungarian uh, uh, monster was created a bit taxpayers' money with European taxpayers' money, and uh, the oligarchs who who run those uh, companies for a couple of years, they were um, uh, only frontmen, um, so they were only playing to be the owners. Uh, meanwhile, uh, till they had to give it uh, give it uh, to the to, to the big boss without any compensation. Thank you, uh, Eva. If you if you can, I have one question for you. Uh, could you explain your 
own situation because you left media, you was a... Well, actually, I do have experience with like the working for traditional media houses and uh, launching uh, uh, my own uh, small uh, independent media media project. So, uh, as Michal mentioned, so I used to be uh, head of business desk of uh, business uh, of daily number one in the Czech Republic. Then after, I used to be editor-in-chief of business uh, uh, weekly number one in the Czech Republic. And then uh, we together with, with Michal decided to launch a brand new company. We were actually the first uh, of this uh, like future wave of small independent new houses. Uh, and uh, we were specializing on um, uh, publishing uh, news uh, weekly and news, uh, uh, sorry, and business weekly just for tablets and for smartphones. And uh, so a couple of years ago, like three years ago, I think, um, this small company was actually acquired by Penta. Uh, first, uh, okay, so we were just like, okay, fine. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice. It's, it's the sign that the, the company is actually viable. So uh, maybe, you know, it will help. Uh, we will have like the revenue streams, new revenue streams, et cetera, et cetera. And can like, uh, you know, uh, develop ourselves much more and much better. Uh, Penta decided to put our project uh, together with the traditional media house uh, uh, that uh, they bought a couple of months uh, before. And then um, the hell started, actually. So it was really uh, something uh, uh, unexpected unexpect because... Uh, 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 our project, we are really like, you know, based on high quality journalism. So we were uh, describing uh, many investigative uh, materials and the connection uh, uh, between the politicians and, and uh, business people. And uh, uh, then uh, we found out that uh, the, the Penta has actually a kind of like background deal with uh, Andre Babish and that uh, he uh, uh, doesn't want uh, uh, our our uh, project exists anymore. And so they were like a lot of pressures uh, and uh, Penta was like, you know, trying to to, to uh, somehow influence the, the, the content. And then I decided that it's uh, it's over. So I found the jobs for <laughs> for my journalist and then then I uh, left, uh, left the business. Thank you. Okay, speaking about uh, Penta, uh, Beata, you have... Uh, also very special experience because yeah. you came to the, to the newspapers a uh, few few days or few weeks after it was acquired by Penta and nearly the whole staff left and uh, established the new newspaper and uh, it was uh, understood that uh, the SME will be the, the newspaper which will lose its uh, independence but you succeed to, to not to go this way. And now, instead of one respected newspaper in Slovak market, they are two. How, how is it possible? How, it, how you succeeded? Now, after four years, I can more confidently say that, yes, we, we managed to keep independence. But, you know, four and a half years ago, I, I wasn't so sure whether we would succeed. And uh, we had no illusion that, that Penta cannot be a good uh, owner of press because even one of uh, their partners said that they are buying media as an uh, atomic suitcase, nuclear suitcase, which means that, that their understanding of media is to balance their power with other oligarchs or to influence their public uh, image by pressing on media not writing about them or writing about them favor favorably. Our good luck was that we had a traditional owner and a traditional uh, publisher who basically promised us uh, to, to shelter from attacks or pressures from Penta. But again, and I, I mentioned already this, this thing uh, today, that it trickled down to the independence and, and to, to every single journalist who continued working as though there was no Penta in, in the publishing house. And of course, we, we got a lot of pressures uh, also from 
Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Robert Fico, who happily used the fact that we are partly owned by Penta, even if by minority. And when it suited to him, he said that we are riding on, on Penta's behalf. I, I also need to mention that, that the success story of Denny Ken is, is a big hope and a great hope. But yes, which is the new daily which is the new daily of the which, team which lost which uh, yes. left your but also this shows the fact that we kept SMA alive and independent is so important because uh, the Hungarian experience shows that it's crucial to have in a country a large media which reaches outside uh, the capital city and and cities and that's why some autocrats just let smaller projects uh, alive and and you know they work it works like a thermostat immediately after a small project grows to to a size which they consider dangerous then start attacking it so we understood that it was very important to keep uh, SMA independent also because the public service television and radio was started being under so much political influence and then we understood that Daily SMA also has to fulfill a public role, which costs a lot of money and which, which actually means that you cannot look at your production on, on entirely to please the, the reader or to please your basically favorite uh, topics or priorities. And maybe just to add one more comment that uh, it showed that the media holding, which was established by Penta, also owned a very uh, famous economic weekly trend. And now trend is almost falling apart because people are leaving this newspaper. And some of the people who are leaving, they are joining SME. In the same way, we took on a team of journalists uh, from the public service television. So basically, we feel that, that we have to give create jobs to journalists who are still doing uh, their work under quite difficult circumstances. Okay, thank you. Back to Poland. When I saw the results of uh, elections to European Parliament, it looks very absurd because if you look on the map of Poland and you make a line from north to south, all districts uh, to the east were electing Kaczynski and all districts to the west were electing uh, the opposition with the exception was for, of Warsaw, which was also voting for opposition to Kaczynski. How is it, uh, how is it possible to make media in such a divided country? I think that this is uh, this is a challenge, but this is also something uh, very interesting and uh, something that gives you power, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, resources to to act. Uh, I, I mean, uh, this is maybe not a place to to explain uh, specifically. Uh, the preferences of uh, Polish voters. But uh, I can say that uh, despite what you mentioned, I have a strong feeling that we, uh, the Polish society, we will not let any government, and this is not only about the law and justice government, this is general, right? We will not let the government to give birth to a monster. Uh, I am very touched by, by, by what uh, Martin said that about the about the the birth of the Hungarian monster. And actually, I would like to ask a question to to Martin, but maybe for a moment. Um, uh, you know, we have a very diverse uh, media landscape in Poland, and as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have independent media, and there are. I would say good um, uh, position, uh, but under pressure, and this is important. And and what is important for me is that we are observing very many alarming tendencies, right? So this is the discussion about alarming tendencies actually uh, in Poland, and those are, for example, the personal attacks on journalists, uh, pursuit. Uh, from, uh, for example, uh, public broadcaster, uh, right? Like, for example, on February 9th or 10th, you could see in Wiadomości, and Wiadomości is our mm, most important um, news, evening news service, right? On the public television, on TVP1, you could hear 
uh, a piece about the private life of the editor-in-chief of Rzeczpospolita, which is a um, newspaper like a Financial Times, something like that, right, in Poland, and one of the most important uh, dailies. So this, some, for me and for us uh, sitting here, this is something unacceptable. That was a piece about his, about his grandfather. So this is one example. The second example, and very striking, is gambling with the article two uh, uh, 212, right? This is the uh, 212 article of the po penal code in Poland that let anyone, and especially let you know the officials or uh, people from business, um, suing, uh, I mean, starting criminal lawsuits against journalists, right? And um, actually, this article should be uh, repealed long time ago, but it still exists in our penal code. Uh, the, um, the third example is um, filling lawsuits against uh, newspapers. Uh, perhaps some of you have read uh, the article on uh, Adam Michnik, the editor-in-chief of Gazeta Wyborcza, that was presented in Foreign Policy magazine. And Adam Michnik uh, informed there that Gazeta Wyborcza has now ag about, uh, about uh, 30 cases Right, that was launched by people. I mean, th those are legal proceedings uh, pursued by the people, um, uh, by the people from the um, from the government and the people connected to, to Polish government. So we see, you know, in Poland the situation, and I guess we are observing it also in your countries and in your countries that uh, that the authorities are circumventing media. Um, it is almost palpable in Poland, you know, you are, I mean, I very much I appreciate what Nina Horacek said today from Falter, that was one of the panelists here. She was explaining her attitude and, say, and said that I am, as a journalist, I am not attacking anyone, I am not attacking any estate. I am doing my job as a journalist, I ask questions, right, and I cover stories. And this is something that very much applies to Poland and Polish journalism. I mean, we still have to explain to people, to stakeholders, to our auditories, but especially to the officials, that we are not attacking anyone. We are pursuing our role, and they are refusing us the right to do our jobs. Instead of um, organizing a press conference about an import, uh, about on an article, important article on some important cover, right? They uh, they just uh, let their lawyers to announce the next lawsuit, and at the same time, they are trying to. Um, drop this topic totally and they're covering their you know twitter accounts or facebook accounts with entirely different stories right so this is a constant communication on something totally different than we are uh covering in the in the mainstream right yeah okay but you are a member of the family of newspapers like bild zeitung and bild zeitung has a strong uh, political position supporting freedom, supporting Christian Democrats, supporting Israel, for instance. So do you have uh, any kind of political position in your newspaper? We have our social approach. I mean, we stand for freedom and democracy, uh, for pre free speech, uh, and those are the, 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 you know, the, the vital values that we stand for, and this is important for us. And a part of uh, um, uh, that, we do not have any uh, political approach, actually. I mean, I run a tabloid. So in Poland, it means that it is rather conservative, more co rather conservative than liberal. This is obvious, right? As my auditory are, uh, you know, the representative of aging society, I would say, right? They need to be, I mean, we have to empower people, we have to help them, uh, we have to t help them navigate better in uh, more and more complex reality and so on. But this is something obvious, right? Thank you. Martin, what is uh, the pos you explained the situation in Hungary, but uh, you did not mention what is the position of HVG. Do you have any political position, or how do you how is your uh, position on the market in this situation when 80 percent is controlled by by the government? So it's of course a question: Who do you ask? Because uh, the government would say that uh, that. Uh, 
I'm asking you. Yeah, uh, that uh, under communism there was um, uh, there was a party media, so uh, uh, a media which was uh, totally loyal to the to the party. And right now they would have in Hungary a media party, so that uh, the instead of the weak opposition, the media, the the the, the left wing. Uh, liberal media would uh, uh, play the role of the political opposition. This is what they are telling about us. Um, but it's not true. So we see uh, ourselves as critical and not as political. Um, but it's, it, it, it's getting harder and harder. Um, you know, we always ask how many activism is allowed from a journalist. And, um, and it's very easy to answer that question if you have a healthy media environment. If you, if you have the financial uh, possibilities, if you get information, if authorities are taking you seriously, um, if you have sources, you can say, of course, there's only one answer to that. You are not an activist, you are a journalist. The problem in Hungary is that authorities are not talking to us. Um, and it's not only the Hungarian government, it's uh, every single authority in Hungary. Um, uh, a school district, uh, 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 a school headmaster has to get a permission from the, from the government to, to say something, so uh, nobody uh, talks under his uh, real name. Um, State-owned companies are not uh, not uh, 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 giving us answers. Um, if you ask a state-owned company something not political, they answer you, and that's a, a true uh, true uh, 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 answer they gave us. Um, they are not uh, uh, answering Havegi because they don't want to take uh, part, or they don't want to help uh, the from George Soros. Uh, orchestrated attack on the Hungarian people and the, the 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 government elected by the Hungarian people. That was a company. Um, we then asked uh, an, another example. Um, we wanted to get on the mailing list of a Hungarian football club. We wanted them to spam us, to send us their stupid letters that they have a new Nike T-shirt. Uh, they sent back that they don't want to do anything with Havig. Uh This is the scale. Uh, problem number two, there are no consequences. Uh, we write something, uh, and Orban, sh Orban always show that he is sticking to the people who are loyal to them. This is a very important message of the, of, of, of the Orban system, that you can get attacked by the Hungarian media with, with real corruption issues. And the people can believe that they are right. But if you are loyal to him, nothing gonna happen to you. If you are not loyal to him, you don't have to do anything wrong and you are away. So there are no consequences. If there are no consequences, there are no sources. Because every source only risks uh, its uh, personal uh, uh, well-being by talking to us, but not achieving anything. And of course, sources do want to achieve something. They want to get the corrupt out of the business. They want to get the, the polluting uh, companies out of their businesses. Of course, sources want to achieve something by telling the truth. But if there's no consequence, there are no sources. So there we are. We have no facts, no sources, no consequences, no money. Uh, and if we want to you know, get to that 20% on the market, which is still out there for us as a revenue, uh, we are pushed more and more into opinion writing, because this is the easiest. Um, cheapest, uh, and of course gives the best uh, clickbait uh, titles. Uh, so we are ruining our, uh, our uh, media uh, credibility ourselves. And now comes the question, shall we, be, shall we be an activist or a proper journalist? I say we should be a proper journalist, but you know, the thing is that, that you ask yourself how. 
how under those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Well, we have last few minutes and I would like to ask you uh, if you can in one minute say if you see any any light in on the end of the tunnel or what what how can you how you see the future how the future can be who wants to start I, I can start and, and I will just continue what, what Martin opened because a lot of things which my colleague from Poland said and, and also Martin goes back to, to actually my first line that, that there is an effort to redefine journalism. And uh, while Orban elevated fake news and, and conspiracy sites to, to a, a governmental agenda in Slovakia, some leading politicians are starting to talk to, to fake news sites instead of talking to, to serious journalism. And, and we realized after the death of, of Jan Kuciak, we realized that we weren't able to explain to people why we are shouting so much when a journalist is killed. Why, why is it a concern to them? And, and they kept asking, why don't you shout when an old lady is killed for 20 euros? And so on, on the positive side, and, and it's, there is not much positive you can take out from murder of a journalist. But, but Jan's murder brought up to the surface so much dirt, but at the same time so much awareness of what journalism is in a country. And we realized when we pour enough effort into explaining what we are doing, that people actually start listening. Also, the positive light is that, as, as we mentioned several times, your project or, or Dienniken or, or some of the smaller projects, they can actually live from readers' contributions. And it means that, that if the reader understands how much it needs uh, independent media, they are willing to pay for content. And so I, I see it also as a positive light. And not least, Robert Fico is no longer a prime minister in my country. And it happened after a murder of a journalist. So what else if not this is a, a immensely positive news that, that in Slovakia, unlike in Hungary, there is consequence for politicians. And it is consequence because we do investigative reporting and, and the existence of free press actually, and, and the power of free press makes that difference. Thank you. Uh, referring to what uh, Bea mentioned, um, very many important uh, actually issues. Uh, I mean, I, I am not going to uh, focus on uh, future or predict future because this is in, impossible for me. I can, I can tell you that I do not believe uh, in the idea, idea of repolonization of Polish media market. I do not believe. I mean, uh, the, you know, the uh, ability to say the openness to, 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 to sell the uh, Radio Z was uh, announced in uh, October and we still do not have any, any, I mean, of course there is, finally there is one uh, potential buyer, but um, the uh, company Agora, uh, together with uh, Soros um, um, Fund, uh, they just joined the bid four months later, right? So this is, uh, I mean, so that this is not a great opportunity for them. This is uh, clear. I mean, we have all the media companies are having problems with their business models. So this is all clear for us. I do, do not believe that, that there will be companies that will do the uh, repolonization to the end. But I would like to uh, tell uh, something about what uh, Bea said. I mean, that this is, uh, what is important for us now is to be, is to have a, uh, deep relation, to deepen the relation with our readers. And what we are trying to do in Poland is translating to our readers what happened in Slovakia, because this is really something, I mean, for us in Europe nowadays, this is uh, totally disturbing what, ha what happens, right? What happened with the, I, I am referring to Jan Kuciak um, murder. Uh, murdering. Uh, referring to uh, Marton, this is also uh, uh, unbelievable for us in Poland. What's what's happening uh, in Hungary after 2010? And we are. W this is our duty to translate it to people so that they understand it better. Poles are. I mean, we are 38 million of people, and they are focused mainly on our internal. Uh, affairs, they are not so much interested in what's going on abroad, but but this is 
really our duty to translate it better to them. And I would like to ask Marton, uh, do, you, do you regret not taking any actions? I mean, I am asking you as a representative of Hungarian uh, journalists, do you regret something? Because the situation entered, uh, started after 2010, right? The Hungarian monster, as you said, was born after 2010. Do you think you could do something more? Or do you think you could drop any actions before 2010? Why it happened, actually? Do you have any insight? Please, very briefly, we are, we are over time. Yeah. Well, I think it was because of the, of the fragmentation of the Hungarian media. There was no solidarity within uh, the critical uh, uh, media uh, outlets. Um, nobody ever uh, fought together. Um, there was a shock when a newspaper was uh, shut down for a few days, but that was it. Um, so, so I yes, I think that 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 the Hungarian media allowed uh, not only the polarization of the country but also the polarization of the media industry. That uh, that uh, the media industry was divided. So uh, there were two sides or three sides. And um, and it was impossible uh, to join forces, and then again, as the real real attack started after 2010, even the critical media was unable to join forces. So, uh, I think the solidarity is a is a very important issue. And uh, the other thing is that 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 if you if you allow a part a, a party with such. Uh, uh, such uh, intentions to get a two-thirds supermajority in your country, you are screwed. Uh, and, and you are screwed in Poland and you are screwed everywhere else. It's, it, it doesn't matter how, uh, because, because it's, it's, it's easy to say that the Hungarians are backing that, that, that government, but we don't know it that sure. It's a small margin, you know. Uh, they achieved 52% with that monster in their back, and the PIS has achieved 46 without it. Uh, it's a very small margin with which they uh, they create a supermajority for themselves. It's not true that the Hungarian society would that much be fond of Orban. He is a very talented guy, and we once were stupid enough to get give him a super majority and we and, and and that's it and you know it's it's basically it and and uh, we can be self critical of a lot of things but but in the end that one single elections in 2010 have set it um and if you want something positive, uh, I always say in the Hungarian critical media, you can work uh, cynically or uh, you, you can work as an idealist. And if you, if you find your idealism, it's never a place and never a time where you are making that much difference. Uh, so, so yes, your job is, is important. And that's, that's, that's the most positive thing that what I can say. Okay, thank just you. Just to sum it up, uh, because uh, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, 30 years after the Velvet Revolution and, and fall of communism uh, uh, in our region, uh, we were talking about intimidation and defamation of, of uh, journalists. And uh, if you look at the Czech uh, market or uh, on the Czech Republic, so nowadays uh, uh, we are, or we used to be the country of Václav Havel. Uh, nowadays we do have... Uh, president who is actually pro-Russian, uh, who uh, is joking about the liquidation of journalists. We do have, uh, uh, for instance, yesterday, uh, the leader of Czech Communist Party, he uh, suggested that uh, a journalist should be named or elected for four years and uh, that they should uh, actually fill the financial statements. Uh, and then after four years, they should be re-elected. He actually didn't explain uh, the system. Uh, he uh, only mentioned that uh, it's going to start uh, uh, within the public uh, media journalists. Uh, I don't know how he dreams that uh, it can be possible uh, in the private sector. Maybe he doesn't know that we are not North Korea. But anyway, and the, 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 the last thing, we do have 
prime minister who is actually listed as uh, uh, ex-agent of uh, communist era secret police, uh, who uh, the prime minister who is actually facing uh, the, the the criminal charges, not just uh, uh, at the Czech market and from the from the Czech prosecutors, but as well from the from the uh, from the EU. And what is positive, uh, maybe you could have read it uh, yesterday, because yesterday uh, we had a huge demonstration in Prague. Uh, it was like the biggest demonstration uh, against uh, the uh, Andrei Babish uh, uh, and uh, his corruption cases. Uh, uh, they were more than 120,000 people demonstrating there, which is really like the largest protest uh, 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 since uh, since the Velvet Revolution, and uh, what is positive? Uh, uh, if you look at all those uh, world media, so everybody was covering this uh, protest. Uh, the main Czech media, mainly in the ownership of Andrei Babiš, we are mentioning it, but um, uh, with a little bit of like you know limitations. And who is actually winning now? As for the media, are the new independent projects that are obtaining uh, uh, like the, the the higher rate of readership and circulation, and I think that this is like a positive uh, uh, way and positive uh, maybe uh, view for the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, our panelists Eva, Martin, Bea, and Kasia. <laughs> And let's meet in 30 years and see how it looks like. Thank you.